of those scintillating things that everybody wants to know, we have had a revision to our organization's bylaws. And the bylaws will be published online and in the newsletter. Um, and we will vote on those at our June regular meeting. So I just wanted to give you the heads up for those of you who really enjoyed thorny legal documents that one is coming your way. Um, enough said about that. And great thanks to John Epperson, a member of our board for helping us in this process. Our, we had a lot of things that needed revision. So that has been a big help. Secondly, we already had a discussion briefly about the salmonella poisoning that's been happening to finches around the Bay Area. If you see any sign of sick birds anywhere near your feeder or any bird baths you have, please empty them and take them down for a, a, at least the next month. Um, so anyway, just kind of giving you a heads up about that. There's a lot more information available online. We will have something on our website soon um, about this, uh, this particular crisis. It has been a uh, a banner year for pine siskins. They are everywhere. Um, so it is not surprising that something would come along that might call that population a little bit. Um, it's, it's def I mean, I'm hearing them in places I've never detected them before, but still we don't want our hobby of watching the birds through our feeders to contribute to bird mortality. So do take down your feeders if you see any sign of sick birds, listless birds, birds that seem to be without energy or unable to fly. Um, and if anybody wants to add something to that comment, if anyone has seen sick finches at their feeder, uh, I'd be happy to um, hear about that in the chat. So go ahead and put that in. I'm sure others would appreciate it as well. Um, we also have, as usual, our concerns about habitat protection in our county. Um, Leslie Flint, who's one of the members of our conservation committee, shared with us that the, there she is, that the Foster City Shell Bar will be inaccessible to birders for an extended period of time. Um, so I wanted people to be aware of that. Do you remember exactly how long, Leslie, you think it will be inaccessible? Two years. That's not good. Yeah, I didn't want to hear that. December 2022 is what they said about Beach Park Boulevard section, but I failed to note because they're going to do the section from the bridge to the border of San Mateo last. And that might be, um, you know, obviously that'll get into 2023, but I don't know if they'll open. I don't know if they're going to open the, the other sections that are finished while they're doing that one. Right. I don't know. So as we find out more about what areas you can and cannot bird. We will post that on pen birds. I'll see if I can get a little addition in the San Mateo County birding guide about that um, so that people will know whether they can count on that area, which is always a species rich part of the yeah. county. I was uh, thinking about how, how the Christmas count's gonna be next year because I won't be able to look for red knots. Uh, you know? I know. But, we probably um, yeah, it's closed that. from the bridge all the way around to Port Royal. Wow, very extensive. All right, so um, in, there's also conservation issues going on right now in the Burlingame area and in Brisbane. And if people live in those areas and want to get involved, our conservation committee, I've mentioned Leslie Flint, I think I had seen that Marshall Dinowitz, who chairs that committee is here. Anyone who wants to help out, even doing armchair activism, like simply writing to your city council, we could really use your help. Um, so we want to continue the proud legacy of the Audubon um, when it comes to uh, to to sharing, uh, or I should say, protecting rather our habitats. Changing these birds. Um, okay, someone's talking. I don't know if you're trying to say something or if you simply are not muted. But I, I think um, they mu muted themselves. Okay, good. All right. So I've just put up the um, copy that I had circulated on Peninsula Birds a few days ago. This weekend is the usual excitement of the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, the Great Backyard Bird Count is an annual event that is sponsored by the National Audubon Society and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And for those of you who already use eBird, 
anything you record on eBird over the next four days will automatically be a part of the Great Backyard Bird Count as well. It's something of a misnomer, the name, because the backyard part is not literally true. For our backyard, they mean anywhere on the planet. So it's a kind of expanded notion of your backyard. By the way, you don't have to mow it or weed it or anything. Okay, don't want to get worried about your backyard that way. But this year we know that a lot of people have become interested in birding for the first time because of being at home more uh, during the pandemic and wanting to be able to take the walks outside that even during the tightest quarantine we've been asked and told was okay to do. So people have become more interested in birding. This is a great opportunity for those of you who are already uh, confirmed birders to help your neighbors along as they sink into our obsession. I mean, as, as they generate more interest in birds and become more avid members of our community. So you could tell them that this is the weekend to get involved. So usually what we do when there isn't a pandemic around is that we hold very small kind of introductory bird watching trips. We can't do that this year. So instead what we did was we reached out to our partners at San Mateo County Parks and Mid Peninsula Open Space Preserves and asked them if we could work with them for the Great Backyard Bird Count. And they have put things up on their website about this. So what we've decided to do is build around a theme and that theme will be woodpeckers. We figure woodpeckers are the kind of bird that beginners can both hear and see and that they have good methods of detecting. For instance, looking for sap, hucker, sap sucker holes, which is what we did in my little party yesterday at, at Wonderlick and then we found them. So it's also the fact that the American Birding Association chose the pileated woodpecker as the bird of the year for 2021. So what we're asking people to do during the Great Backyard Bird Count, there's two things. One is to go see the seven resident woodpecker species in San Mateo County. So to the best of your ability, try to see these seven. The acorn woodpecker, the downy woodpecker, nuttles woodpecker, hairy woodpecker, the northern flicker, the pileated woodpecker and the red-breasted sapsucker. Additionally, we have two special overwintering rarities among the woodpecker family, yellow-bellied sapsucker and red nape sapsucker. If you manage to see all seven of these regulars, or you see more than seven, you see one of the special ones as well, please drop me a note um, and or you can drop a note to the Sequoia office. All these um, emails are on our website. And that way we'll know how many people were able to see all the species of woodpeckers. Please let me know also if you were able to document them with photos or with sound recordings in your checklists. The second thing we're gonna try to do is accumulate over 150 species for the county in the four day span of the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is a modest goal, I think we can make it, but that does require people to go out and make sure that they're seeing all those birds that are sometimes a bit harder to find. All right, and I got your best. Uh, someone's speaking again, but um, I guess you're on mute now. And on Sunday morning, I will share a list of any species that are missing on our list so that people can target even more precisely. And finally, Sunday is Valentine's Day. And who hasn't seen Valentine's cards that have birds on them? And if I recall, elementary school and junior high school uh, teachers use birds as a way to metaphorically explain the joys and of fecundity and reproduction. So we know that birds are connected with Valentine's Day. We know they're connected with love. So let's let the birds be our Valentine. And we will follow the lead of Donna Pomeroy and do a distributed big day for the county on Sunday. And we'll keep track through the day on Sunday of what birds have been seen and what our final total is for Sunday. So now really what better thing to do with the person you love than go for a beautiful walk out of doors to see birds. It just, it reeks of fecundity, so do it. Um, 
And if you want more details, you can go to our website. And I just urge everyone to get out there and participate this weekend in particular in the Great Backyard Bird Count. All right. So is there anything else that other folks here at the meeting wanted to report about birds, about the organization? Um, um, Marshall, you have your hand up. I do. I'm sorry. When you mentioned me earlier, I had you on mute and I couldn't get to it quickly enough. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, I, I chair the Conservation Committee and um, Leslie, who has been one of our um, most active people in that area for many years be preceded me. Um, and I haven't meant, I haven't spoken to the other members of the Conservation Committee or Jennifer about this, but the National Audubon is um, working on getting uh, cooperation from chapters, Audubon chapters and others around the country to consider being involved in getting local jurisdictions, cities, counties, and other jurisdictions um, to make proclamations about making their communities bird safe. And I will be following up shortly um, to encourage us to get involved in getting our communities, and we have many different communities in the area, to um, uh, get our, our local governments, our city councils, our, our county uh, boards of supervisors to be aware of birds and to uh, try to encourage them to make uh, proclamations to um, say that we want to be bird safe communities. And so look for a follow up on this. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful news. Um, and because it is Black History Month that we're going to be turning now to our scheduled speaker, unless someone else wishes to speak, um, I would add that any involvement we can have as an organization in the greater field of environmental justice and fighting environmental racism is important. And of course, we know that some of the, the most polluted areas in our county are in East Palo Alto, for instance, you know, so, and that being one of the poorer areas in the county and an area where a lot of people of color live. So the more that we can connect these dots and put our, our weight behind helping um, those communities, the better for the organization and the better for the country, frankly. Um, and speaking of that, I just wanted to announce, um, I'm not political at all, as you all know. Um, I never have a political opinion, but uh, I did hear that uh, President Biden today canceled all the funding that was going to the border wall. So um, just noting that because a lot of birders love going down to the Rio Grande. It's one of the best areas in the country for birding. And that area was being severely disrupted by the border wall. So um, anyway, that's a Great good news. news. All right. So um, with that, I will turn to the main topic for tonight which has to do with the man, Sam McDonald. Many of you know of the park, Sam McDonald County Park. It's been a favorite park of mine for a long time. And I have utilized that park as a site for our bio blitzes um, and also as um, a, a place for iNaturalist surveys. Um, but part of what drew me to it was the story of the man, Sam McDonald. And this is something I often say to my own students when I teach, which is if you find anything that gets said tonight to be interesting, do me this one favor, tell somebody else about it. Uh, because this is a hidden corner of San Mateo County history, but one that we really need to shine a light on. And to help us with that tonight, we have Ranger Catherine Wright from the San Mateo County Parks System. Um, Catherine comes from a family of naturalists. Her parents have been, um, have been members of Sequoia Audubon Society and attended this meeting before. Um, and she is someone who has lived in and around the county for much of her life, including um, now living very close to Sam McDonald Park. She attended the University of California at Davis, 
uh, and after graduation came back to San Mateo County and started working for county parks um, in the area of outreach. Here at, San, at uh, Sequoia Audubon Society, uh, we got to meet Catherine by working together on our highly successful program to bio blitz all of the county parks. And this has been a massive effort. I know we have um, Julian Johnson here from the um, California Lichen Society who's also been involved in that. But we brought a lot of organizations together to turn attention to the natural resources in the county parks. And Catherine has been really the moving force behind that in terms of setting up all the logistics, putting us in touch with the, uh, the, the lead ranger in each park and getting us access when we needed it. So she's just been invaluable and that's a major contribution that she has made to the, um, to the wildlife of the county. Um, she is also, um, a, uh, has been working very closely with us over the last few uh, weeks to do this great backyard bird count woodpecker spectacular that culminated um, on Saturday in a wonderful webinar with our very own Alvaro Jaramillo on the woodpeckers of San Mateo County. If you haven't had the opportunity to see that, I understand it has been posted now um, on the county website and also on, on ours, I believe it will be. So there, um, we, we've had a great deal of fun working with her. And all of that is to say that you're going to hear someone who knows her stuff tonight and who has already made massive contributions to Sam McDonald Park. But she's also just one of the really fun and knowledgeable people to be with in out of doors in this county. Um, she is someone who I got to take a hike with at Wonderlick the other day as we searched for the pileated woodpecker and found it. But the kinds of things she knew about that park were astonishing to me. And I thought I knew the park pretty well, but I was learning every minute I was out there with her. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Catherine Wright from San Mateo County Parks. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Jennifer. That's such a lovely uh, introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with the Coiva Audubon Society and all the great projects that we've been able to put on together. So I'm looking forward to seeing and many more projects together and many more collaborations. Um, today, um, I want to speak with you about Sam McDonald. Um, I'm going to give a little context about Sam McDonald Park and our department, who Sam McDonald was as a person and his unique life and history at Stanford University as well as in La Honda. And uh, I also want to talk about the other properties that came to be a part of this park and their unique histories. So if you have any questions, I uh, would ask you to please save those for the end and we'll get started into the legacy of Sam McDonald. First off, uh, Jennifer did a great introduction of myself, so I don't need to go into too much more detail, but I just wanted to say that I, was, I grew up in San Mateo and was fortunate enough to spend much of my youth exploring the outdoors and making memories with families and my family and friends. I crawled through the base of towering redwoods, uh, slipped on the slick tide pools of the coast. Um, and in 2010, I began working for San Mateo County Parks at the Pescadero Creek Park Complex, which includes Memorial County Park, Pescadero Creek County Park, and Sam McDonald Park. Uh, the focus of my job at that time was providing nature programming uh, for the campers at Memorial Park. Um, and I fell in love with the area and the job and I never really looked back. After college, I helped develop and I'm currently supervising the department's first ever interpretive program. And I've been hosting programs and events uh, for members of the public and schools ever since. And of all the hikes that I lead throughout the year, one of my favorites is the history of Sam McDonald Park. So uh, let's dive in. Our department manages 23 properties, which consist of 18 parks, two regional trails, two historic sites, and one marina. And for reference, Sam McDonald Park is right down here in beautiful La Honda. Um, if you haven't been to Sam McDonald County Park, here are some sites that you might see. Uh, newts and tiger lilies are some of my favorites. 
The park is home to various plants and wildlife and from the infamous mountain lion to the UC Santa Cruz mascot, the banana slug, from the iconic redwood trees and dense forests to open grassland and panoramic views of the Butano Ridge and out to the Pacific Ocean. And since this is a talk for the Sequoia Audubon Society, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the variety of birds that can be found within the park as well. We frequently see California quail, wild turkey, Stellar's jay, barn swallow, American robin, and spotted tohi, among, among many others. The marbled merlet, which is featured in the center top photo, is an endangered seabird that nests in old growth redwoods and Douglas fir trees. And it has been spotted nesting in Pescadero Creek County Park, just about a half mile south of San McDonald County Park. Um, also, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, that a uh, pileated woodpecker can be found at San Miguel County Park. So if you're interested in see, watching that woodpecker webinar we hosted last Saturday, uh, you can go to our San Mateo County Parks web uh, YouTube page and it's there. All right, <clears throat> San McDonald County Park. Here's a map of the park. It's made up of 850 acres of parkland, which was acquired in three property segments, each with unique histories. The first, is this segment north of Pescadero Creek County uh, Road, <clears throat> Pescadero Creek Road. And this is the portion that Sam McDonald owned. The next segment was the town property, which was just south of uh, Pescadero Creek Road. Um, and then there was Heritage Grove, which is this 37 acre portion over here, which I'll go into the history of those later on. The park terrain starts at about 300 feet in elevation in the northwest corner and climbs to about 1,250 feet um, in the southeast corner. And so you can see from this town ridge, this town fire road here, the Butano Ridge to the south, Skyline Ridge to the east, and even the Pacific Ocean. But today we are here to talk about Sam McDonald. Meet Sam, or Emmanuel Bruce McDonald, as he was named at birth. Sam lived an extraordinary life with many accomplishments during his career at Stanford University and beyond. He was born in, on January 1st, 1884 in Monroe, Louisiana. He was the fifth of seven children. Sam's grandfather on his father's side was granted freedom by the young plantation owner who had inherited him with other enslaved persons. Sam's grandfather befriended the former enslaver which enabled his grandfather to learn how to read and write, which was usually denied to enslaved persons. The family's given name came from the Scottish landowner of the plantation. Sam's father, Peter Bird MacDonald, was a Methodist minister. Sam's mother, Priscilla Wheatley, was born into slavery and wasn't freed until the conclusion of the Civil War in 1865 when she was nine years old. Pictured here is Sam MacDonald in the middle his father, Peter Bird McDonald on the left, and his younger brother, Jesse, with Sam on the right. I've given this talk uh, about Sam McDonald almost 10 times now, and I try to always dig deeper each time to find something new to discuss. This time around, I found myself curious about the context of Sam's birth and the culture into which he was born. Uh, Louisiana was a leading slave state. And in 1860, 47% of the population was enslaved. Louisiana succeeded from the Union in 1861. And in 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed, which abolished, abolished slavery, but the South wasn't ready to accept those changes. Paramilitary groups formed in the 1870s and used violence and outright assassination to turn politicians out of office and to intimidate African Americans and suppress black voting, control their work, and limit geographic movement in an effort to control labor. Racial tensions and violence were high, and there were 21 lynchings of black people in Louisiana in 1890, surpassing the total for any other state. In 1890, Louisiana also passed a law requiring separate accommodations for non-white and white passengers on railroads. This law would go on to be tested in Louisiana with the infamous case of Plessy v. Ferguson. 
in which there was a landmark decision of the US Supreme Court that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities, as long as the segregated facilities were equal in quality, a doctrine that came to be known as separate but equal. 1890 was the year that Sam's family moved to California. It wasn't mentioned in his autobiography, Sam McDonald's Farm, why his family moved, but given this context, I can only imagine many possible reasons. Sam's family moved to Southern California first, where Sam began school for the first time. This was when he was six years old. Where, and this is also where his father began working in sugar beet farming. Sadly, Sam's mother passed away when he was only 10 years old. The sugar beet business in Southern California began to fail in 1897 due to a practice called continuous cultivation. And this led to the impoverishment of the once fertile lands. So Sam's father moved the family north as they followed the farming business to Gilroy. Sam recalls being one of the first black families in Gilroy in the Santa Clara Valley. In his autobiography, Sam mentions enjoying living in the valley and that everyone was very welcoming and offered work on their farms. Sam obtained a seventh grade education before he dropped out of school to support his family by working at, local, at a local farm milking cows. This is a photo of Gilroy in the eight, late 1800s. In 1900, when Sam was 16, his family decided to uproot once again to follow farming pursuits all the way to Washington State. He recalls the trip in detail in his book, but said upon leaving California, he found himself becoming, quote, grievously homesick and that he had made up his mind to return to heavenly California. In the night, he created a plan and snuck away from his family. He stayed with friends that they had made along the journey northward and bartered his time and possessions to make the trek homeward. And if you're like me and have picked up new hobbies during the pandemic, through Ancestry.com, and I'm not plugging their product in any way, I was actually able to find the 1900 census sheet in which has Sam McDonald label at, as a border. You can see his name right here. Um, he's a border in Canyon City, Grant, Oregon. His profession is labeled as a day laborer for the Sewell family. In Sam McDonald's book, he speaks fondly and highly of the Sewell family and explaining that it was with their kindness and encouragement that he felt comfortable with his journey. The Hall family, neighbors of the Sewells, hired Sam to help work um, raising horses and cattle on their property. Sam was able to save up money and purchase two horses at the price of $25 each and finally set off on his journey back south on October 11th, 1900. Sam gradually made his way south, and upon pre reaching Sacramento, Sam sold his two horses and only had $35 to his name. That equates to about $1,000 today. He purchased a trip on the steamboat ship, the Modoc, which is pictured here, and this delivered him to San Francisco. He really enjoyed his journey on the Modoc, and, and so much so that he wanted to work aboard any ship that would offer him work. <laughs> He tried to enlist in the Marines, but was rejected because at the time, no persons of color were permitted to serve in the Marines. The Navy rejected his application for not being old enough. Remember, he was only 16. The Army Transport Service in Oakland interviewed him, but he lacked the experience they were looking for. After these experiences, he became discouraged in pursuing seafaring work, and he pursued other opportunities. In San Francisco, he was approached by two men asking if he would be willing to work in a studio for a couple of hours. Not knowing what this meant, Sam went to the Newt studio on Clay Street and posed as a model for art students. This worked well and Sam came back for several different sittings until they asked him to pose in the nude. Sam was very conflicted about this because of his strong Christian background. He believed it to be a sin and left and didn't come back. <laughs> Despite being too young, he found work as a chore boy, <clears throat> galley hand, and swamper on the Modoc, uh, having made acquaintance with the chief chef, um, the cook, on his journey to San Francisco. 
He was paid at about $15 per month. After six months working on the MODOC, Sam had the opportunity to advance to a crew member, which was a very highly coveted position, but he turned it down due to his desire to return to the Santa Clara Valley to work the land as he did once as a boy. In June of 1901, Sam made the trip down to Mayfield for the first time. This is a map of uh, Mayfield here. The town of Mayfield dates back to 1853, and by 1855, the town had a post office, railroad station, stores, saloon, and a school. When Senator Leland Stanford founded Stanford University, he wanted to choose Mayfield, but he considered the town's many saloons to be inappropriate for a university town, which is kind of ironic <laughs> considering today's university towns. Stanford's request to close the saloons was rejected, so he formed nearby Palo Alto in 1894 as a town where no alcohol could be sold, and he established Stanford University there. The increasing wealth and population of Palo Alto, as well as the 1905 ban on alcohol, led to the, the decline of nearby Mayfield, and they eventually annexed to Palo Alto in 1925. Upon arriving in Mayfield in 1901, Sam became acquainted with some teamsters, people who care and for and lead teams of horses. And the, the teamsters worked in the area and Sam uh, spent the next couple of years working on local farms and ranches. Now in his book, um, one of the stories he tells is uh, meeting Chris Iverson who lived near Pescadero Creek in modern day Portola Redwood State Park. Uh, Chris Iverson was one of the first European settlers in the area, and he also has a really interesting history that is worth checking out if you have a chance. In approximately 1903, Sam mentioned going camping with friends out to the old Iverson cabin for a trip full of hunting and fishing. He described it as a trip which anyone would have envied. This is the first time in his book that he discusses visiting this area of San Mateo County, and I believe that this trip may have influenced his decision to later purchase property here. In 1903, at the age of 19, Sam began his long employment at Stanford University, aka The Farm, which is where he gets his title for his autobiography, Sam McDonald's Farm. He was hired as a teamster to haul gravel from San, Fran San Francisco Creek for the maintenance of campus roads. He was paid at $1.25 for an 11 hour day. Sam was a friendly and kind man and made acquaintances very quickly as you will see throughout his life story. He says his labor and attitude found him favor with his supervisor at Stanford and in less than a year, he became the straw boss or sub foreman for the crew. This is uh, photos of some buildings at Stanford University in 1900, the library, the Memorial Arch, and Assembly Hall. While working at Stanford, Sam followed many academic pursuits, including meteorology, phrenology, and law, dreaming one day of practicing law. He didn't attend the university, but he would pay students to tutor him in the subjects of interest. He also studied criminal investigations and attended police secret service school in which he obtained an accredited membership in the American Detective Association. Later in 1904, he received many offers working for other organizations and detective agencies, and he decided to approach his supervisor with this new interest in mind. His supervisor, while really appreciating his work on the crew, recommended his new appointment at Stanford as one of the two night watchmen at the university. And Sam was also appointed deputy by the Mayfield town marshal. Later in life, Sam continued these pursuits and served as a secret service agent for the US treasury department, as well as deputy constable for the new Palo Alto township and as deputy sheriff for Santa Clara County. Here is Sam. Uh, in Mayfield riding on a, uh, a horseback driven carriage. <laughs> Next, so as a night watchman,
Sam worked nights on campus and uh, was responsible for uh, checking in on students and uh, patrolling the campus. And he was living on campus during the 1906 earthquake and describes it as follows in his book. Quote, I was a night watchman at the time of the quake and had just turned in when the ground started shaking. I guess the water tap in my bathroom busted, but when I was jogged awake and saw that water floating under the door, I thought for sure that we had just dropped off into the ocean. Sam went on to describe how he spread his long boned arms to demonstrate how the tree bent during the quake. Um, Sam had planned to be at the powerhouse the morning of the quake, but he had gotten off of work at 4.30 a.m. and changed his plans and went to bed. At 5.13, the quake hit. The earth shook and bricks fell and much of the university was laid flat, as you can see in these photos. The power plant smokestack fell, killing the young heroic night foreman who had dashed back inside to cut off the power. Sam always felt that he was spared for a reason and that the catastrophe um, influenced his already strong faith. After the quake, Sam was put in charge of the student crews who cleaned up the bricks around campus. Many of these bricks were later used as foundations for campus roads and to underlay the track after the stadium was built. Here are some more images of the scenes of the aftermath on uh, the campus. In 1907, Sam became the superintendent of athletic buildings and grounds, a position he kept until his retirement in 1954. He was in charge of the maintenance of sports fields, tennis courts, tracks, grounds, and boat houses on campus. And with this appointment, Sam became the first African-American to hold a major administrative position at an American university. Sam lived on campus throughout his employment, first in an old training room at the football stadium and later in the attic of the old track house where he converted the room into a living space. And here's Sam, uh, I believe at the track. In 1921, Stanford completed its new football stadium Sam planted the new sturdy turf, but he also worked out a method of mowing alternate sections between yard stripes so that they appeared to be planted with different types of grass, otherwise known as striped turfing. Grass bent away from you appears lighter and grass bent towards you appeared darker. I've tried to look into this more and it seems that he might have been one of the first people practicing this method. Sam's pride and joy was Angel Track and Field, named after Dr. Angel, the head of the psychology department. Here's some images of the track uh, before its renovation. Sam was put in charge of rebuilding the track in 1935, and he became known as a national authority on track maintenance. He was often sought out for his advice from other universities throughout California. Sam was also in charge of maintaining the grounds on campus, and he did so with the help of a herd of 400 sheep that he maintained. And he liked to refer to, the, to them as his animated lawn mowers. He also ran a dairy of about, of about 40 cows on campus, providing fresh milk for students and faculty alike. Sam's generosity went above and beyond providing milk. <laughs> He was devoted to helping Sanford students. He invited students over to his home on campus for meals and provided loans to students if they were short of funds. He loved to perform intramurals with students in track and boxing. He hosted barbecue fundraisers for every sports team on campus, roasting his famous lamb ribs, as can be seen in this picture. He um, <clears throat> made friends with everyone he met including former President Herbert Hoover, a Stanford alum, who always made it a point to visit Sam with his wife to trade gardening trips when they visited Stanford. Speaking of which, Sam grew an amazing campus garden open to anyone who wanted to harvest food. 
Sam had many sayings written on the walls of his home on campus, and one of which stated, he who has a thousand friends has not one to spare. He even played Cupid for one Stanford couple, as mentioned in the book, uh, and is appropriate for Valentine's Day right around the corner. The student in the book saying, Sam, I had a time in getting my lady friend, now my wife, to go out with me until she found out that I was a friend of yours. It's easy to say that Sam was one of the most well-liked persons on the Stanford campus. In May 1941, Sam McDonald Road was dedicated to Sam. At the ceremony, the then Stanford president, Ray Lyman Wilbur commented in his dedicated dedication speech, if I ever had to run against Sam McDonald for the presidency of the university, I'd be mighty afraid of the results. Sam McDonald Road is still there today as a footpath that connects Stanford Stadium to El Camino Real, and it still has a sign up, so you should go check it out. Sam's generosity also extended to the Stanford's convale Stanford Convalescent Home for Children, which was established in 1919 in the old Stanford mansion by the university chaplain. Affectionately known as the Con Home, it was founded to care for children with chronic illnesses such as polio. Stanford was the only university at that time with its own charity. It is, the hospital is now known um, as the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Sam was a major supporter of the Con Home and would visit every day, spending hours with the children, reading stories, singing, and playing his concertina. He spent most of his Thanksgivings, Christmases, New Year's Day, which is his birthday, and Easter egg hunts with the kids. During World War II, when evergreen Christmas trees were scarce, Sam hiked his property in La Honda to find the perfect tree for the children at the hospital to decorate. Sam grew pumpkins in his famous campus garden for the Con Home kids to carve on Halloween and planted watermelons and peanuts so that they could see how things grew in the South. Sam McDonald Day was first celebrated in 1920 and was held every May thereafter for more than 25 years. On that day, Stanford students volunteered at the Con Home to paint, work the gardens, and to visit with the sick children. The day ended with a fundraising picnic for the Con Home with Sam as barbecue chef. But enough about Stanford. Uh, funnily enough, Sam recalls in his book, one of his first trips to La Honda was to fetch grain when working for a farm in Mayfield and he tells the tale of encountering a bear. <laughs> he says in the book, quote, my only thought was to get out of there fast and never return, and now to think I, I there abide. <laughs> in 1917, Sam acquired 430 acres of steep redwoods in La Honda. He built the home pictured in this photo, which has several bedrooms, a kitchen, bathroom, and living room with a spacious porch overlooking Alpine Creek. And of course, his home is painted cardinal red, and you may notice the Stanford pennant hanging above the door. Sam is accredited with being the first known African American to own property in the Redwoods. He named his home Chichi Wawa, meaning little squirrel in an Indian language. I'm still not sure of which language it comes from, but he states in his autobiography that he was one eighth Choctaw Indian, so perhaps it is uh, in Choctaw. He built a dam over Alpine Creek and created a small pool he called Moqui after a Hopi princess from the Arizona tribe. He established the La Honda Alpine Yatoya Reserve to afford asylum to all wild creatures. Despite the potential for great income, he refused to allow hunting or logging on his property. As you can see in the quote here, he says, I have journeyed there after my day's work that I might rest and work and meditate and pray in the seclusion of nature's sanctuary. Sam often used his property as a quiet place to reflect and pray, but he also liked to entertain friends and family at his home. While he lived on Stanford campus, for the rest of his life, he visited this property most of his vacations and many weekends. 
Neighbors in the nearby community of La Honda recall him driving his iconic Ford Model A along Highway 84 through the early 1950s. Here, Sam is pictured playing his concertina at his home with some friends. The concertina is like a, an accordion. <laughs> Most of all, Sam admired the redwoods, the lords of the forest, he called them. Sam was a devoutly religious man, and these giant trees inspired his loftiest thoughts and loftiest flights of language. He also called them a grand aggregation of lords. As Sam stood at six foot four, his friends commonly noticed a likeness, both in stature and noble nature, between Sam and the giant trees he loved. Sam once said, it is wisdom itself to find happiness with one's fellow man, equally so with nature, the bounties of Mother Earth and the creatures that walk, fly, creep, all begetting inspiration. During Sam's later years, he worked on a book of his memoirs called Sam McDonald's Farm, mostly focused on his memories working at Stanford University. It is currently out of print, but there is a copy available for, uh, to read in uh, the Burlingame Library, I believe also at the Redwood City Library. Sam retired from Stanford in 1954 after working 51 years on campus. When being honored at his retirement, Sam was given a new car to replace his old roadster. He was elected as an honor honorary life member of the Alumni so Association and under the sponsorship of the Palo Alto Times was ushered into the Stanford Hall of Fame. Sam had broken all records for length of service at Stanford. Sam sent over 800 Christmas letters each year and one such letter was discovered in a copy of Sam McDonald's farm that was generously donated to the Parks Department. Written on Stanford letterhead, on December 22nd of 1953, it reads, Dear Mr. Lauritsen, the laudatory remarks in your letter of June 2nd, 1953, informing me of honorary membership in the Stanford Block S Society and approved by you and your associates was gratefully received. Mere words are meaningless to express the extent of my gratitude. Its contribution to Sam McDonald's farm will be of much significance. It's sincerely yours, E.B. Sam McDonald. P.S. Good friend, please accept all my good wishes for your household for the enjoyment of a Merry Christmas and a happiness throughout the coming year, Sam. Unfortunately, in his later years, Sam suffered from diabetic gangrene in both of his legs and had to have them both amputated. While he was recovering in the hospital, Hundreds of people visited him. Sam passed away in November of 1957, and he bequeathed his home and property in La Honda to the Convalescent Home for Children at Stanford. They, in turn, sold it to San Mateo County for use as a park. It was Sam's wish that the land be used for young people. The land was dedicated as a park in 1970. Few people were better loved on the Stanford campus than Sam McDonald. He attended every big game for 50 years, and he passed away just a few weeks before the big game the year he died. At halftime, instead of forming the traditional battle acts, the Stanford marching band grouped in the letters of S.A.M. and played the Stanford hymn in his honor. Then a Stanford card stunt spelled out in memory of Sam. In connecting back to the context in which Sam was born, it wasn't until 1954 that Thurgood Marshall brought the landmark case Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka before the U.S. Supreme Court. In its pivotal 1954 decision, the Supreme Court unanimously overturned the 1896 Plessy decision and found that legally mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional. Almost Sam's entire life, the Supreme Court had found separate accommodations to be considered equal for persons of color and white persons. And it wasn't until after Sam's passing that the heart of the civil rights movement began. 
The walls of his home at Stanford and La Honda were covered with pictures of his many friends, the generations of families of children he held with babies of their own. He also had mottos and quotes written on walls. Here are some of my favorites. Remember people on your way up as you will meet the same people on your way down. May your blessings be as numerous as the land, sands of the sea. He that does good for good's sake seeks neither praise nor reward, but he is sure of both in the end. I can think of no quote that better represents Sam than that last one. Sam didn't get married or have any children of his own, but in May 2015, I had the honor of meeting Sam McDonald's grandniece, Leanna Brunson McLean, and showed her around the property with my coworkers. She is pictured third from the right, and Leanna shared many of her childhood memories of visiting Uncle Man, as she called him at his home. Uh, Leanna and her family visited from Indiana, and this tour was the first by any uh, Sam of McDonald's relatives in recent years. She also shared some photos of uh, Sam from their personal collection. To the right is a photo of Sam McDonald with Leanna's brother at Sam McDonald Road in Stanford. The house is currently in disrepair after flooding that occurred during the 98 El Nino storms. And we hope to restore it soon to its former glory to inspire others about Sam McDonald's life and legacy. The Sam McDonald, uh, Sam, San Mateo County Parks Foundation will begin seeking donations soon to help with, with the large costs needed for this project. Quickly, I want to cover the unique histories of the other pieces of property that came to be a part of what is Sam McDonald Park. The town ranch, so this section here, and the Heritage Grove portion. So this photograph shows the last roundup for the branding of Kendall Bartley Pete Towns cattle in 1968. Uh, the town family owned this section of the park and was run, it was run as a cattle ranch. Uh, the ranch was sold and became a part of Sam McDonald Park in the 1970s. It is now the area of the park that includes the Jack Brook Horse Camp along the town fire road and the town ridge. Pete Town founded Town Ford in Redwood City and shortly before his death wrote a collection of memoirs of La Honda called Forget Me Not Under the Redwoods. Sam uh, mentions Pete Town in his book and recalls him as a good neighbor and also mentions affection for Pete's grandfather, who was also known as Pete, and who was a longtime resident of Mayfield when Sam served as a deputy marshal. Heritage Grove was almost logged in 1974, but it was saved when Grace Ann Radwell, who lived in a semi-primitive cabin on nearby Alpine Road, Rage, waged a campaign to save it. Like Sam, Grace had an, a special appreciation for this area. Grace called it Shangri-La in summer and Pneumonia Gulch in winter. One day, however, she noticed blue slashes of paint on the bark of the largest trees in the grove, indicating that they were scheduled for cutting. She formed a citizens group to stop the destruction, enlisting the support of 26 environmental organizations. She said, for a year, I did nothing but eat, sleep, and save trees. And before the drive was over, they had bushel bus baskets full of money and every cent they raised went towards the trees. Holmes Lumber, the previous owner of the property, pl placed a price tag of $190,000 on the trees. Grace launched into a countywide effort and raised $80,000 for the 37 acre parcel. And on July 25th, 1974, the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors put up the remainder of the money to purchase the trees. This story makes me think of Margaret Mead's famous quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So what is Sam McDonald's legacy? I think it is present in the overwhelming sense of generosity he gave throughout his life. It's in his grand appreciation for the beauty of nature. It was in his kindness for everyone who crossed his path. 
It's present today in this amazing property that he left behind for everyone to enjoy and appreciate. I like how Nick Rao of Post phrased it in his most recent article about Sam McDonald on their website. The true legacy he left behind was that of breaking barriers while exuding generosity and selflessness. If only we can all embody a piece of Sam's legacy in our lives every day, I believe the world would be a much better place. Thank you. And I wanna say thank you to the Sequoia Audubon Society for hosting tonight. And thank you for all joining to learn more about the life and legacy of Sam McDonald. I hope that you get a chance to visit this beautiful park sometime soon. And I'm uh, open to any questions that might have come up during the presentation. Thank you very much. That was very informative and I learned a lot. And I think it's very appropriate for, um, for us to learn both about the park, but also about black history. And then to combine that with these other stories of rescuing the other parts of the park. So it's an interesting way to, to see how each of us in different generations has a responsibility to the land. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to look at the chat here. We do have a number of thank yous coming through um, and I'll wait to see if any questions come through. And you can also raise your hand if through some miracle you have not yet had to use Zoom during this entire um, year of COVID. Um, in order to raise your hand, you need to bring up the participants list and then next to your name, um, you will see that option of raising your hand. So if you want to do that, then I can call on people in a uh, respectful way. Um, and again, the, it, do me this one favor, tell somebody else about this, <laughs> you know, and get the word around because it's one of the great hidden stories of, of uh, San Mateo County. Okay, we have a question from Judd. So let me unmute you here. And all right, I believe you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. And Catherine, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I was wondering about where um, Sam's old house is relatively in the park and, or is it part of the park or in an adjoining property? Um, yeah, that's my yeah, question. Yeah, um, let me bring up a, the map again, um, just to show you where it's at in the park. If you were um, visiting the park, it is, here's my screen. Um, <clears throat> so if you were to visit the park um, right around this one marker, it, this is the junction of Highway 84 with Uncle Man Road that was uh, named after Sam. Uh, the nickname that his grandniece had for him. It's right um, but after this bridge on the right here. Um, it is in a lot of disrepair. It is not blocked off from um, the public. I saw that as a question in the chat as well. So if you do want to visit it, um, you can definitely go visit it. Um, we will be uh, doing a lot of work uh, to determine how much work needs to be done to restore it soon. And so there might be some bo boarding, more boarding up of the house in the next few months uh, to help uh, protect it from weather. So, it's, so it's you, you don't have an estimate of- Functions one and two. <laughs> so you don't have an estimate of the cost to restore or-, uh, or We don't have an official yet. estimate, but we are, we are thinking it's gonna be closer to a million dollars uh, wow. to, okay. Thank to you. restore what needs to be restored, so. And when that does happen, uh, we will cross list that uh, on our Sequoia website as well about uh, where you can make donations. Okay, I had um, Lynette Vega, you wanted to speak? I, I just wanted to, um, Sam McDonald Park is in my backyard. And um, I was curious about the relationship with Sam McDonald and the town of La Honda. Yeah, um, so I have a, he speaks, he speaks fondly uh, in, about La Honda in his book. And I uh, have uh, the La Honda history book that was written about the town. And there's a picture, a couple of pictures of him in that book as well, as well as a picture of him uh, with the, the Catholic church. Uh, there's a, a picture, group picture with him and the, the rest of the Catholic church that's here in La Honda. 
Um, so I, I believe that he was a, a, me a member of the community um, and, and participated in community uh, group events and whatnot in the, the community here in La Honda, but I don't know much more beyond uh, pieces that I've gleaned from his book and uh, photographs. Thank you. Uh, I see a comment in the chat about the house. Uh, we aren't sure what purpose it will serve moving forward, but we would want to use it as uh, a place for interpretation for people to learn about Sam's story and a place for them to learn about why, um, you know, this, his property and his life story. So a museum, it might be kind of like a museum, maybe a visitor center of a sort. Um, there's a question from Ann McMillan. Yeah, uh, my family was friends with Sam and uh, there's some thought that Sam bought the land there because of the friendship. Um, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I would love to you, speak to you and I should more. talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also had the thought that before Air Hazi bought Boots and Saddles, which is a very old bar um, in La Honda, it was run by a very famous retired jazz musician. And I'm wondering if he came there because Sam was there. So there might be a more of a story there. Interesting. But, I'd love to speak with you more <laughs> about your family's remembrances of Sam. That sounds amazing. Yeah, we have pictures that. of my dad playing with Sam in the creek. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I just also wanted to say that if you're a birder, the, the path between Heritage Grove and Town Ridge is one of my favorite trails out there. And it goes through so many different habitats. It's a great birders trail because you come up out of the canyon, you know, house wrens, and then you walk by Wilson's warblers, and then you're up in the in the sunny meadowlands. So it's actually a, a hike I really recommend to birders. It's about a mile. It's a pretty steady up. So. I, I would I would endorse your recommendation. That's yeah, one of the best a, hikes in the park for uh, wildlife diversity. And then there's water and a bench at the top, so you. You can't lose that one. And I'm, I'm interested now that you mentioned that trail, Catherine, um, the hiker's hut that exists, uh, that's run, I believe it's the- um, Two people. Oh, right. <laughs> it's okay, you can, just, your it's cat, too late now. Your cat is um, even happy now. Um, yeah, the hiker's hut's run by the Sierra Club um, and you can book uh, a stay through the Sierra Club website. I just need to search I think Sam McDonald Hikers Hut in Google and it will pop up. Um, it's relatively uh, cheap accommodations and all you need to do is hike up front. You need to park in the, the main parking lot uh, at Sam McDonald Park and then hike up from there. Um, and and uh, it's a great place to stay. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really is. It's lovely. Um, I did, I did, I think someone asked about the, uh, the fire um, the recent fires and Sam McDonald Park was not affected by the CZU lightning complex. It, it, it did burn through about a third of Pescadero Creek County Park, which is just south of Sam McDonald County Park. Um, but fortunately, Sam McDonald County Park was spared in this most recent fire. Do you know more about the status of mountain lions in, the, in Sam McDonald Park? Someone asked. Um, I don't know anything more than that they are there. Um, I, I, <laughs> um, they, they are present. Uh, we do have wildlife cameras and, and see them occasionally. Um, but I've, I've not personally seen one in the park and I Someone hike there almost every week. Um, but I, you know, maybe I've just been unlucky or lucky, however you want to look at it. <laughs> Um, Sandra, I, I, all I can say is I have hiked alone many a time at Sam McDonald Park and I'm talking to you. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I guess it is safe, but I, I would add the caution that anytime you're in open territory alone and at Sam McDonald Park, you're often a long distance from where you have had to park, um, you should always be cautious and remember the uh, mountain lion safety tips. Yeah, I will also add that I hiked alone there quite a bit. Um, and that um, the park is technically closed after uh, 5 p.m. currently. And uh, so that, so you should be out of there before dark in theory. Um, I see any badgers in the park 
I have not seen badgers and we haven't caught them on our wildlife cameras, but I do believe it is habitat for badgers. And I know that there was a, a badger roadkill found up on Highway 1 near Stage Road about a year ago. So they are present in this area of the county, uh, but I've not personally seen evidence of them. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I don't see any more raised hands. Um, we will call this an evening with a great deal of, of joy at having learned so much and such an important piece of our local history. And the very fact that we have a park named after an African-American is something that we should be celebrating every year. And uh, as the recent commercial with Steph Curry has it, every month is Black History Month. And so spread this information, um, make sure people know and get out and enjoy the park. I think it's wonderful. I would also recommend the walk up um, the Town Fire Road when you emerge into the meadow. Uh, that's been a very rich area for birds. We've also had great luck with lichens in the park, with slime mold in the park. Um, there's plenty of amphibians. It's just, it's a wonderful place. So get out there, explore some more, and look for the fundraiser to help um, rebuild uh, Sam McDonald's um, little squirrel residence up there. <laughs> Thanks again, Catherine. We Thank really you agree. all, and I hope to hope you have a chance to visit the park. It is a beautiful place, and visit the Lords of the Forest, as Sam McDonald called them. Thank you all. And we hope to see you next month for our next presentation, which will be on birding in Morocco. So hope to see you then with John Sterling from the UC Davis area, uh, who will be speaking with us. He's a, a fine tour leader and also the organizer of California's County Birders. So we hope that we'll see some of you for that presentation. And in the meantime, I want to thank um, Sequoia's administrative uh, uh, administrator, really, Davina Gentry, for putting this webinar together and um, keeping this meeting in order. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. I'm going to stay around for a little while if people have questions, but thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, please, uh, Davina, if you wouldn't mind making sure that Catherine and our treasurer are in conversation for the um, for honorariums.